You know, Christianity was a pretty big deal during the Middle Ages. At a time when Europe was beset on all sides by heathens, the one thing uniting our dear ancestors was praising the Lord. It clearly wasn't a perfect union, considering how frequently they'd kill each other over trivial details such as whether icons were cool or not, but it was a union nonetheless. Now, one of the ways our Christian ancestors venerated the Almighty was through relics. These were objects with particular significance to Christianity, like the remains of the apostles or fragments of the true cross. These holy items were said to invoke various miracles from God, including, but not limited to, the healing of grievous wounds, the spontaneous eruption of freshwater springs, and the prevention of natural disasters. With such an incredible sales pitch, it should come as no surprise that Christians became absolutely obsessed with relics. There was one big problem, though. While Christianity grew rapidly, the supply of its relics did not. Most relics were located either in Italy or the Holy Lands, which had been under Muslim control since the 7th century, with a brief intermission from our friends, the Crusaders. Thus, for the vast majority of priests and bishops in Northern Europe, procuring a relic was really not feasible. However, if an entrepreneurial bishop could somehow secure one, he and his bishopric would stand to benefit greatly, and not just from the prestige. As soon as word got out that your church contained the remains of Saint So-and-so, you could expect an annual flood of pilgrims eager to spend their hard-earned coin in the hopes of receiving a miracle. The procurement of said relic was a task best left to the experts. These could be either crusaders returning from the Holy Lands with plenty of looted, uh, <clears throat> I mean reclaimed relics, or merchants of questionable virtue who just so happened to find valuable relics in abandoned catacombs. We do know of a certain Dias Dona, who during the 9th century maintained his very own trade network trafficking stolen relics from Rome to Frankfurt. Of course, since the demand for relics vastly outstripped the supply, it's highly unlikely that all of these smuggled relics were actually authentic. Indeed, if you add up all the relics of St. John the Baptist, for example, you'll conclude that he had three heads and five arms. Now, these are obvious forgeries, but there were some that were much harder to spot. Pieces of the Holy Shroud and splinters of the true cross were favorites among counterfeiters. The running gag was that there were enough splinters out there to build a warship. You might be wondering, with good cause, if counterfeiting really was this rampant, wouldn't the clergy demand some sort of proof before accepting a relic? Well, since relics did not come with certificates of authenticity, the only real way to see if the relics were genuine was if they worked. Thus, if the blind regained their sight and the crippled started running, then the relic must have been the real deal. If that were the case, the newly healed would then also start spreading the word of this relic far and wide, and considering the lack of printing presses and mass literacy, that was about the only marketing a relic could get. A great case study is Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury. After he was brutally murdered in his cathedral, the surrounding area saw a spurt of miracles and everyone visiting his tomb would be healed, apparently. When word of these miracles reached the Pope in Rome, Becket was canonized as a saint, and before long, Canterbury became one of the top pilgrim destinations in Europe. One of the reasons for Canterbury's enduring success was its marketing. The monks would offer vials with the blood of St. Thomas to anyone that visited. Ooh. The blood was diluted with water, of course, so that there would be enough for everyone. But that was all right because its efficacy was said to remain exactly the same. It was really only with the advent of modern forensics that the forgeries finally started getting revealed. That is how we learned that the Holy Shroud, for example, actually dates from the 13th century and almost certainly didn't rest on Jesus' face. Well, 
That, my friends, concludes our reading of Christian relics and where to find them. If this video has inspired you to become an enterprising relic hunter, I would be more than happy to share in the proceeds of your future business endeavors. But only, of course, if you believe and repent of all those naughty misdeeds of yours. Ah, yes, we at SideQuest have eyes everywhere. But fear not, my friend, we're on your side. And your secret is safe with us in return for perhaps a quick subscribe. You may also repay this favor by liking this video and sharing it with your friends. Or if you're feeling especially generous today, by becoming a patron on Patreon. Anyhow, whether it be searching for the Holy Grail or sitting in front of that wonderful computer of yours, we'll see each other again two weeks from now for another impiously profitable episode of SideQuest.